Good morning, everybody. Welcome to chapel. Can you believe it is week six of the semester already? We are over a third of the way done. Man, yeah, you excited about that? How many of you are encountering your first exams this week? Anybody? All right, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm one of the professors giving one of those exams, but uh, may God have mercy on your soul. I hope you do well. Seriously, um, I know things are going to start to get busy now, but um, just want to encourage you to stay focused, keep moving forward, pray hard, keep your eyes on the prize. Um, This week is a special week for TFC. We have a bunch of leadership from the CMA on campus. CMA stands for the Christian and Missionary Alliance, um, also just known as the Alliance. This is the church denomination that TFC is affiliated with, and they are fantastic. You're going to be seeing some people that you don't recognize in your classes and around campus and at certain events, so don't shoot them with your water guns, please. They're not spies in disguise. Uh, Instead, welcome them, introduce yourself, let them know why you think TFC is awesome. So today and tomorrow, they are going to be hanging in the coffee shop at 4 p.m., and then tomorrow at 8, there's also going to be an ice cream social in Werner Mission, so consider dropping by and saying hello. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to the music department to lead us in worship. Well, good morning to you, TFC. It is good to be with you and to be uh, leading worship with you this morning. Uh, I'm going to ask you to stand, and as you do, I want to share with you a verse of Scripture. These are the words of Paul in the closing chapter of Philippians, a letter that he wrote, of course, to the church at Philippi, but what you might not know is he wrote this from prison, one of the last writings that we have from Paul. And he says in the opening verses of the final chapter of the book of Philippians, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. If Paul could write those words exhorting his fellow believers in a distant place as he sat in prison awaiting almost certain execution, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. If he could write those words in that situation, how much more should we be able to then stand today and declare his praise and rejoice in the Lord? He is good. Amen. And he is good always. We may rejoice always. So I invite you to sing with us this morning.
Amen. Give the Lord the praise in his sanctuary.
praise belongs to him alone. There's only one way. There's only one way to the Father. One love that melts a heart of stone. He is the life and resurrection. All praise belongs to Him alone. To the Lamb. See the Son of God, the Savior crucified. See the crown of thorns, the nails, His wounded side. He is worthy. Look to the Lamb. See the one who is forever glorified. There is love and there is fire in his eyes. He is worthy. He is worthy. He's the Alpha and Omega. He was and is and is to come. He will return to shouts of glory. Oh, 
Father God, you are worthy this morning. You and you alone, worthy of all praise, of all glory and honor. God, you are worthy, and only you are worthy of our lives. Lay down in submission to you. We stand before you this morning grateful and so thankful who you are and for what you have done. You have wrought salvation full and free. And God, we praise you and we thank you. God, we pray that you would take the remainder of this time. Would you use it for your glory and for your purposes? Give us hearts to hear your word. I pray for our speaker as he comes now and speaks your word to us today. Give us ears to hear and a heart to receive it. And I pray you would be glorified and honored in this place this morning. We praise you in the name that is above every name, our Lord and our Savior, your Son, Jesus Christ. And all of God's people said, Amen. Our speaker today is Paul Honeycutt, who currently serves as the director of Envision. I'm excited already. Uh, Paul serves as the director of Envision for the CMA. Envision is an awesome alliance ministry that can be found in cities all around the world. Uh, a lot of you are familiar with Envision Atlanta, which reaches out to Clarkston. Fantastic ministry. Envision sites focus a lot on leadership development. So they seek to invite, mobilize, and multiply those who are exploring their role in God's mission. These are great places to do internships at if anyone is looking for that. Um, Paul and his wife, Lori, are TFC grads. All right. Majored in cross-cultural ministry. I know they are both. Well, Paul is, is your wife? Okay. So just Paul is excited to be back here um, on campus to share with you all. So please welcome Paul Honeycutt with me. Interesting, as you get older, you know, it's almost 20 years since I graduated from here, um, and white shoes were in. Like, they were like the thing to do, like when I was coming out of high school and into college, and then it kind of faded away. But all of you took notice that everybody on stage here up front this morning was all wearing white shoes. So it just tells you that things do come around. Uh, the things that were cool back then are now becoming cool again. Um, and so... Uh, this morning, it's a privilege for us to be here as an alliance team. Uh, joining with me, just to, so you know who's in the room with us, is pa uh, President John Stumbo is with us. Um, we also have uh, Tim Meyer, uh, who is the Vice President of Development. Uh, Amy Redding is right behind him. Uh, she's Canada Development. And then we have Terry Smith, uh, Vice President of Church Ministries. And then we have Scott with Orchard Foundation. I'm so sorry. I don't know your last name. I, what's that in? Kubi. Kubi. Uh, Scott Kubi is here with Orchard Foundation. This is our team uh, this week. Um, and I was encouraged this morning, uh, President Stumbo just shared with us, like, hey, we want to be here uh, because uh, we want to talk about Jesus. The reason we're here is Jesus. Uh, and so I would, uh, I think the team would agree with me that we want to be here because we want to share testimony of what Jesus is doing around the world. We want to tell testimony of what Jesus is doing around the world through the CMA. Uh, but we also want to begin to engage with you as students and hear your journey and your stories and what God's doing in your life. Um, and then we also want to take time to invite you to consider being a part of what God is doing in the Alliance and the cool things that are going on around the world. Um, and so we just want to make sure that that's our posture coming in. We're here to serve you. We're here to engage with you. We're here to share what God is doing around the world. And so please find us. Some of us are going to be in your classes. Uh, some of us will be in the coffee shop at times. But just feel free to come up and just talk with us. We want to share uh, more about what God's doing around the world and through the Alliance. Uh, this morning, uh, I'm going to be sharing just a little bit about of, out of Luke 10, uh, 17 through 24. So if you want to go ahead and turn there. But I've titled this, The Joy of Knowing Christ and Being Engaged in Kingdom Work. Um, I found myself about uh, eight years ago, 
uh, sitting overlooking a pretty large piece of property in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, months before that, one of our local church uh, planters and pastors on the east side of Cleveland came to me with this vision of wanting to do an oasis project. And if you know very much about Cleveland, Cleveland was one of those cities that was uh, one of the hardest hit cities in the housing market crash in 2008. And so properties aren't always well kept. Uh, and this was one of those properties, about 3.8 acres of land, it all grown up and it was like the worst of the worst briars, trees, all that kind of nasty stuff. And he says, I want one day to people to walk through here and experience Jesus in a different way. And I found myself saying, okay, we can do that. Not thinking through any of that, but on that day as we were sitting, uh, I was sitting on a tractor and Pastor John was sitting there and he says, Paul, I thought you bit off more than you could chew. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, do you see that there's no trees, there's no vines, there's no briars, there's nothing left except for people from the church that have mowed everything down and that was clear to begin to plant again. I said, you're right. I said, I did bite off more than I could chew. I never knew this was actually going to happen. I just said yes because I'm just stupid enough to say yes and we'll try it. But in that moment, Pastor John began to say, we got to stop right now and thank the Lord for what he's done. And he says, if it wasn't for Jesus, these types of people wouldn't come out and clean this property because nobody comes to this property. It's these kinds of stories that I love sitting around, whether it's in a circle around a campfire, whether it's sitting on a tractor, and hearing stories of what God has been up to and what God has been doing through his people. As we look at Luke uh, 10 this morning, just so you guys have a little bit of context, in, in chapters 9 and 10, we see a lot of things that the kingdom work happening. We're seeing people become, being healed. We're seeing people being fed, large amounts of people. We're seeing... Jesus teaches a number of different things. He's, you know, sharing with people about what it means to follow Christ and what the cost of all those kind of things. And then we get towards the middle or towards the end of chapter 10, and we get to just kind of sit in and see what's going on in verse 17. And this is what it says. The 72 returned, or the, 50, the 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall. Like lightning from heaven, behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and all over all power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Verse 20, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice, as we heard as we were praised in worship this morning, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Verse 21, in the same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of the heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to the little children. Yes, Father, for such as was your gracious will, all things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows who the Son is except the Father, or who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And my favorite part of this ch chapter, then turning to the disciples, he said, Privately, blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desire to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Lord, I pray as we take a moment and just uh, reflect on a number of these verses here, will you begin to help us to understand how big a deal it is that we get to see you and what you've done and that we get to receive your salvation. Help us to understand what do we do with that. That it's not just a story in a book, but it's a story that should compel us. So will you speak this morning to what you would have your people to hear this morning? In Jesus' name, amen. So as we look at that, as I shared that story before with Pastor John, it was interesting because that story... I started with the end of the story. I gave you a little bit of context of what was going on at that, at that property. But the reality is that the work that we did was really difficult. We had many pieces of machinery. We had tons. Of, we had 500 people that showed up for this day. 
But for that moment, as we were sitting there, I found myself going, man, wow, look, God, what you did. In the same context of this story here, as we see, as we uh, jump in on, uh, in verse 17 of chapter 10, we begin to see the people coming back from when they were sent off to go off and do ministry. We don't know, again, if you read before this, you would know what they did and what they had to go through and the instructions that were given to them. But a lot of times, I feel like stories, when we talk about what God is up to, we talk about maybe some, we more focus on how hard it was or the focus of the sacrifice, and we forget to talk more about the joy of what actually happened. And the reality is, is that big things are happening in this moment. The 72 return back. They're excited and they're full of joy. It says right there in verse 17, uh, because of what they saw. And it's, what's cool is that Jesus is sitting right there with them going, he's rejoicing with them too. He's going, yeah, see what, look, look what happened to Satan. He's being taken. But what's interesting in that, even that first part of that, uh, of verse 17 uh, there and uh, through 20, is that in all this excitement of what God had been up to and the work that was being done in the kingdom, he reminds them. A gentle reminder. Again, he is there, he's excited. And he's teaching uh, disciples, the people that are with him. But he says a gentle reminder, rejoice in salvation through Jesus. As we look at that, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. This is all good work, but let me remind you why we do what we do and the ability that you have to be able to do it is because of Jesus and the salvation that you will have through me. So the first thing is to remember that we need to be grounded in salvation, understanding that we can do a lot of things, but the salvation is through Jesus, and that's why we're able to do those things. The second, second reflection of this passage right here is also that Jesus is rejoicing. He's excited, but we also see the acknowledgement of Jesus saying it was because of the Holy Spirit working through me that we're able to accomplish these things. As we see that, as we see what's happened, we know that these people were sent out, that Jesus sent them out. But it's also Jesus recognizing that, hey, I have depended on the Holy Spirit, and look what's happening. That people are coming to know me. People are coming and turning their lives over to the, to the Lord. And it reminds us that we have to be dependent on the Holy Spirit. And the power of the Holy Spirit allows us to do things that are beyond our imagination. Salvation comes through the Father, through Jesus we see, again, this posture of thankfulness uh, from Jesus himself saying, hey, I recognize what's going on here, Father. This is actually taking this full circle. It's all coming down, and now you're allowing me to take it from here. And so we're, people are able to see this. And I don't know about you guys, but I, I get super excited about running into people. Um, like, I'm one of these kind of geek guys. I'm always observing um, like if I go to a mall or I go to an airport, I'm always just watching people. Some people probably think I'm a little bit creepy, but I'm just like, it's fascinating to watch all the different people. But I've found myself in places where I get to meet people that are pretty famous. Um, and and I, I always kind of play it up. You know, you tell the story, the fish story, like I got to hang out with Bernie Sanders. Well, I got to hang out with Bernie Sanders in the Atlanta uh, check-through line. It was only about three minutes, but Bernie Sanders, as kooky as he maybe is portrayed on the screen, was actually a pretty nice guy. But I came home, and I'm like, hey, you know what? I hung out with Barry San uh, Bernie Sanders today. And they were like, what? The guy that's, on, that's running for president? I'm like, yeah, we hung out in Atlanta airport. I didn't say it was three minutes. I just said I hung out with Bernie Sanders. <laughs> and most recently, um, uh, I don't know if this is a good thing that I should tell you, but I, I ran into Ludacris in the airport. Uh, and he was all kind of garbed up. He had a face mask on, a hood, but I knew it was ludicrous. And I made a point to say, what's up to ludicrous? But my story that I told was, man, I ran into ludicrous, and we hung out in Atlanta airport. I share that because I think my son, Hudson, who's 16, also has this excitement. He loves basketball. He loves Giannis Antetokounmpo from Milwaukee Bucks. And we were in Orlando Airport uh, coming back from a, a council, Alliance Council. And he's like saying, Dad, Giannis is over there. I'm like, no way. No way. He's like, no, Dad, it's Giannis. 
And I said, what are you going to do? He's like, well, maybe I should go up and talk to him. And by this time, he's just doing this. He's just shaking a little bit. He's like, but it's Giannis. I'm like, yeah. You know, and he got his alliance cap out. He's like, maybe I should get him signed. I'm like, yeah, here, I'll get you a marker. And so he goes up to Giannis. And what was so crazy, this guy, like, larger than life, bends down, puts his arm around my son, and begins to have a conversation with him. And they talked about basketball. What's your favorite place to shoot from? What's your favorite position? He signed his uh, hat. And he walked away that. And my son's like has tears coming down his face. He met one of his heroes. The difference between my stories and his stories, he actually hung out with Giannis. He interacted with Giannis. He shook his hand. He felt the arm around him. He felt like he was in the presence of Giannis. And you can imagine the stories that my son would go home, and they were true. They weren't lies like mine. I got to hang out with Giannis. And so we began to collect every Giannis card that you could ever find or that we could afford. Uh, I share that is because the reality is, as we get down to the last part of this passage right here, is that these disciples and these people that were walking with Jesus got to spend time with Jesus. My son got to spend a very short moment with Giannis. And you would have thought that he spent the whole day with Giannis. The reality is the privilege of knowing Christ, especially in this moment, as we read in verse 23, as Jesus turns them in privately. So there's probably a sense of privacy, and they're like, these are my close buddies. These are the people that are walking with me. Blessed are the eyes that see what you have seen. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desire to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. You are in the presence of not just what God, what Jesus was doing in miracles, but just the revelation of who Jesus was and what the Father had sent him to do. They are experiencing a firsthand experience. And it's not a surprise to us that these disciples went on to take forth the gospel. And I have to believe that a large portion of it is because they were able to spend time with Jesus. Just like my son for that short moment hanging out with Giannis, he would say that was one of the greatest times of his old, his old childhood because he got to spend a short time with that. But how much more of you and I, those of us that would claim to know Jesus, don't have that same type of posture? And to realize that not everybody has access to see and experience all of Jesus. Even in America. But not to even mention the other parts of the world, the people have never even heard the name of Jesus. But we have a chance to see. We have a chance to sing and to worship and praise the Lord here because we somewhat know of who Jesus is. And yet so many people don't know. So one of the questions I asked this morning is, will knowing Christ in this way, having access in a lot of ways to what these disciples had access, that the kings and the prophets had not had before them, will it compel us to be part of kingdom work? Will it compel us to do more than just the status quo? The reality is, as we look across the needs of a world and the desperation of people that need Jesus, it's grand. Jesus talks about it in the first part of chapter, of chapter 10 is that the work or the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are what? Few. And we're to pray earnestly that we would see more workers. And I'm coming here today to say that we need more people that are about kingdom. And that you are in a prime part of your life right now as you are at a school that claims that Jesus is king. A, G, uh, a Jesus that is, has a heart for the world. And you have a chance over these next how many years you're going to be at Tekoa to continue to fade into flame and to be in presence with Jesus, to learn extra things about how to take Jesus. Don't waste it. It's a privilege. 
We just read about it right here. Many people didn't have the chance to sit here and be with Jesus, and he was telling his disciples, you have had a privilege to be with me. Don't spoil it. Take that with you. I shared with you before that this was the joy of knowing Christ and being engaged in the kingdom. And the reality is, if you want real joy... It's about knowing Christ. Knowing Christ brings you joy. I came to the Coal Falls College in 1999. And I thought I was going to go, I had plans to be a youth pastor. I thought it would be cool to be a youth pastor. And then the Lord got a hold of me and said, Paul, and I want you to be willing to go anywhere. And I said, okay. I raised my hand. It was over when we used to have chapel in the gym. I got married, and our goal was to go overseas and serve in West Africa. I was on this boat. Like, man, I I couldn't hold in what Jesus had for me. I wanted to go and take that. And I was a guy who was singing, Lord, please send me to Africa, not the song, please don't send me to Africa. And I was like, man, I'm selling out whatever he's asking me to do. And then we had our first child, which are my daughters, Riley. She's 18 now, and found out a couple years into her being born that she had cerebral palsy. And so my plan to go overseas and do the things I was supposed to be doing, that I thought I was supposed to do, the things I was being called to go do, I was being told, no, I can't go do that. So the first real check, if we want to look at this passage, is like it wasn't about the work, Paul, but it was about what you are in me, Paul. I've called you to be more than just going to West Africa. And I could go on and tell you our story, and we've had the stories of kind of ups and downs of how God has worked in our lives, but I can say without a shadow of a doubt at this moment in my life that I have joy. If you know very much about me, and most of you guys don't, coming to the national office was not always an easy shift for me. I like to be on the street. I like to hang out. But the Lord has guided my wife and I to a place that in all the things that we've been doing is that we've had found true joy. Not that we didn't have it before in Cleveland, that we didn't have in other places. But I can tell you that the joy has not been dependent on where I'm located. It's not been dependent on the things that I could or could not do, but it's been dependent on Jesus because he's always showed up. And as as Jesus is sharing with his disciples and these these 72 and the 12, he's saying, hey, I want you to to be all sold out for me, but I want you to remember it's about your position, your identity in me. That will compel you to do whatever he's called you to do. And so this morning, I just want to encourage us as we look at that, that um, if you're not experiencing true joy, if you're not experiencing what it means to know Christ, I would encourage you to begin to figure out who Christ is. To not take for granted and value the salvation that you have in Christ. And as you begin to wrestle with that and you begin to value that and we begin to praise and we begin to thank the Lord for those things, I'm confident that it will compel you to be part of kingdom work. The reality is that some of the challenges that we have is that we seem to take on things that maybe bring us short moments of pleasure and not true joy. And so I would encourage you to begin to think through what does it mean to experience true joy? And maybe even ask the question, what does bring you joy? Will you take hold of your salvation that is in Christ Jesus and rejoice? Is that enough? And so if the Lord asks you to do something that maybe wasn't exactly your plan, can you continue to go forward because Jesus is guiding you? Your joy joy is found in Christ. Are you willing to yield to the Holy Spirit to lead and guide and empower you to engage in kingdom work? We see that Jesus was fully dependent on the Holy Spirit to guide and direct him for where he was going. Are you willing to allow the Holy Spirit to guide and direct you and lead you to where you need to go? Will you take what you know and have experienced through Jesus to others? Will it be a posture of excitement to tell like my son was when he was excited to tell everybody about the basketball player that he met in the airport? 
Is what Jesus is doing inside of you compelling you to do things that are like, wow, I can't help from being involved in people's lives and sharing the gospel with people and engaging those types of people. I'll close with a story this morning about a gentleman. His name was uh, Ben. And he was a guy that walked closely with the Lord. And he was in the city of Cleveland, and he had a heart for homeless people. And more specifically, this one gentleman named Vic. And he was the neighborhood drunk. He was the guy that was always doing something. And I can remember, I mean, sometimes drunk people are funny. But it's also really sad in a lot of ways, too. But I remember the sad moments of Vic where he was so blitzed out in his life. But then I also remember the times that he was walking, riding a gurney across the hospital floor saying hey to everybody. But was sad that he was never sober enough to really be able to comprehend the things that were being told to him by his friend Ben. But it was the actions of Ben that surprised me is that Ben made a place in his garage for Vic to sleep. Ben made sure that he was always warm. Ben always made sure that he had a place, to, something to eat. He always was talking about Jesus with him. And I even asked one day, I'm like, Ben, why do you keep doing this? And he says, I'm not far from that. And because of Jesus, I have to do something. And I'm like, yeah, but there's a ton of homeless people out here. Doesn't Vic just annoy you and bother you? He's like, yes, everything he does is frustrating, but I can't get away from loving Vic and making sure that he does not ever not have an excuse not to know who Jesus is. You fast forward a year or so past that conversation as we were having that. Um, I saw Vic in a hospital. He wasn't doing well. He was being admitted because he had fallen and he was really sick and so he was having to be forced into sobriety. So for two or three weeks he's going through detox and guess where Ben was at? Right there. And when he got to a place where he began to be coherent and understand, Vic said, hey, Ben, you know I was listening. All those stories you're talking about Jesus and all those things that you're telling me about what God had done, can you tell me more about what I need to know about knowing that guy? Two weeks later, Vic passed away. Now, some of you would say, man, I'm so glad that Vic knows the Lord. I, I would agree. I'm looking forward to praising the Lord but with sober uh, Vic in heaven. But I even want to more encourage you to look at an example of a Ben that said what Jesus has done inside of me and the joy that I've experienced from being and knowing Christ compels me to be part of kingdom work like Vic. I will say it again, the, wor- the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. I can say for myself, and I could probably agree with my team here that's here, we're praying earnestly for people that want to get messy and get in kingdom work because of what Jesus is doing in your life. And so we're praying for you. So whatever your journey takes you, whether it's with the CMA or somewhere else, we want you to be about kingdom work. Don't take for granted the position you have in Jesus because of your salvation. Don't take for granted the opportunities to come and study and be around people that love Jesus and take time out of their day to praise and worship and and live in community around Jesus. Don't take for granted of that and don't hoard it. Begin to make preparations of how you're going to use those things. Because this is all an incubator system and Jesus was able to walk with all these disciples and then he's going to launch them because he's going to go away and go, hey, it's up to you guys. I've empowered you. I've showed you how to do it. May you be those that say, hey, because of my relationship with Jesus, I want to go and take it and be part of kingdom work. Lord, thanks again for today. Thank you for your word that there's these fun stories, even personal stories. That we see you sitting with your disciples and you kind of whisper behind you and say, hey, you know this is a big deal. Don't take for granted what you're seeing. In the same way, I pray that for each student that's here, each professor that's here. 
that we will wrestle and we will own and appreciate and rejoice in our salvation that we have in you, Jesus, as an expression of that thankfulness and that rejoicing that you'll continue to move us towards people that don't know you. And that maybe one day we will sit around in a circle and tell stories of what you did through us. And that time maybe just be in heaven. But may that be a great day because we took seriously the sacrifice you made for us and the opportunity that you've given us to be bearers of this message. May you go with us today and we're grateful that you love us and that you invite us into your mission. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.